Well, welcome everyone. I'm John Thwaites and I'm the chair of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and Climate Work Centre and co-chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar to launch the Net Zero on Campus Guide for universities and colleges to accelerate uh, climate action. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, uh, sea and community. I pay respects to the people of the Kulin Nation on which this guide uh, was written and on which I'm joining from today. And I pay respect to elders past and present. Today is the Asia Pacific launch of the Net Zero Guide. And we have uh, representatives from universities throughout the Asia Pacific region on this webinar. Uh, later today, there'll be a launch of the Guide for Europe, Africa and the Americas by Professor Jeffrey Sachs. The webinar is being recorded and will be shared after the event on SDSN's YouTube. Universities have a big responsibility to contribute to the global transition to net zero emissions so we can have a safe planet for ourselves and our children. Thousands of universities have made net zero commitments, but achieving that will be the challenge. We created this project to give universities the practical information and the tools that they need to realise these net zero commitments. We also hope uh, to build a, a community of practice involving uh, universities around the world to support each other in their decarbonisation efforts. I've put up on the chat the link to the site uh, uh, on the SDSN website, and you can uh, go on that link now or afterwards and also see where you can express interest in the community of practice. The development of this guide has really been a team effort. The uh, SDSN, which is a global network of over 1700 universities committed to sustainable development and climate action, has helped facilitate the collaboration of universities around the world on the project. Climate Work Centre and the Monash Energy Institute based at Monash University initiated this project and led the detailed development of the guide. And there's been very valuable input from a university advisory panel uh, with representatives from all major continents. Today, uh, the guide is going to be launched by the President and Vice Chancellor of Monash University. Professor Margaret Gardner. Then you'll have an opportunity to hear from the lead author of the guide, Rebecca Powell from Climate Work Centre, from Srijan Pandey from the Monash Energy Institute, and from members of that global university advisory panel. There will also be an opportunity for some questions and discussion. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. And once again, I refer you to that uh, website in the chat. Now I would like to introduce Professor Margaret Gardner, who will launch the guide. Professor Margaret Gardner is the President and Vice Chancellor of Monash University and has been since 2014. She is one of Australia's most preeminent university and community leaders and was appointed a companion of the Order of Australia for her eminent service to tertiary education. Importantly though, for today's event, Margaret has personally driven Monash University's uh, commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2030 and backed that commitment with major funding and uh, resources. The guide that we're launching emphasizes that net zero plans need buy-in from university leadership. And we've been very fortunate, Monash, to have had very strong leadership from our president and vice chancellor on the net zero journey. 
So welcome, Margaret Gardner. Thank you, Professor Thwaites, um, for that very generous introduction. Um, and good afternoon to everyone who's watching today and um, of course to the fellow panellists who I can see on the screen clearly now. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to the launch of the Net Zero On Campus Guide and Online Toolkit. I would also like to acknowledge that in my case, I am sitting on the unceded lands of the people of the Eastern Kulin Nations and pay my respects to elders past and present and to acknowledge traditional owners of all the lands from which people are joining us today. Um, higher education is institutions, particularly universities, as um, John Thwaites has said, both here in Australia and abroad, play a key role in the global transformation to net zero emissions because they have many ways to contribute. There are thousands of them. They are often indeed substantial greenhouse gas emitters themselves. They oversee large communities of staff, students, and others in the community associated with them. Their campuses often function like small cities. Um, and as such, the sector has a real opportunity and a real obligation to build strategies to reduce operational emissions. And most importantly, to also champion climate research knowledge and action in the wider community. The way, one of the ways to do this is through this launch today by providing institutions with the support they need to decarbonise their campuses by 2050 or sooner. And that's what the Net Zero on Campus Guide is for. As has been already said, it's a joint partnership between Monash University's Energy Institute, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and Climate Work Centre. It is a wonderful example of collaboration and just one way that we can see that collaboration can advance this important goal. The guide provides, we hope, higher education institutions with the tools they need to reduce emissions from their campus operations. So that's all the decarbonisation initiatives that can be made across energy consumption, mobility options, buildings, waste management, and the way they actually organise their value chains. But it also should serve as a starting point for universities and higher education institutions more generally to provide resources and case studies that are applicable across the network. We can all benefit by learning from one another. We are all operating in slightly different circumstances with co different contexts and different resources and sharing is an important way that we can advance this goal. Universities can demonstrate to others climate action innovation. They're well placed to measure the effects across industries, cities and the broader public and therefore be able to hold up the mirror both to ourselves and to others about what is being achieved and what, they, and what should be achieved. Um, at Monash University, our commitment to addressing climate change and ensuring sustainable development is not only in what we like to think is wonderful and indeed world-class research and education, but also by how we can walk the talk, as they say, and lead in the organisation by example. We have a very ambitious net zero initiative for the university as an organisation. The name is net zero, net zero Carbon Emissions by 2030. And in 2017, we think we were the first Australian university to commit to that goal. Um, we raised 218 million through a climate bond to fund sustainable development projects on campus. And we were early in the, that particular way of raising funds by issuing a climate bond. And as a result of the work that's been undertaken here at Monash over the past six years, more than 55% of Monash's very considerable energy requirement, because we are a big research, um, big energy consumer, um, more than 55% of our energy requirement is now supplied from renewable energy sources. So this campus guide, its online toolkit, most particularly as John Thwaites indicated, the community of practice, we hope addresses 
a need among university leaders and sustainability practitioners about how not only do we collaborate, but we are able to dynamically adapt in what is unfortunately rapidly evolving and not an environment perhaps not evolving in quite the direction we would like. Um, it's a great example of how the Sustainable Development Solutions Network brings universities together. And so we're encouraging everybody to be part, including ourselves, of accelerating net zero ambitions by the way we use the toolkit and the guide, but most particularly how we collaborate and contribute to the network. Together, we're going to make a more, much more tangible difference than we will alone. It is, um, I might say, the impetus to collective action uh, is something that needs to be sometimes re-emphasised that we usually do better together than alone. I'd like to take this opportunity in concluding to acknowledge and congratulate the many people who've helped bring this important initiative to fruition. I particularly want to thank Professor John Thwaites, the host for today's launch. He's been a real leader and champion of this initiative through the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And we thank him for his work within and beyond the university. Nicole Aseppi, who's a Monash Fellow, an advisory council member of the Monash Energy Institute and director of the Global Energy Innovation at the Bezos Earth Fund, who's been supporting Monash's role in this, in this initiative. I'd like to thank the Energy Institute, its director, Ariel Liebman, the wider Monash Climate Works Centre, all the people who've worked to this. And I'd like to thank the people who are speaking today and among our guest speakers, including the people from Monash, Srijan Pandey and Beck Powell, I'd like to thank um, Miriam Pujale from Aga Khan University, uh, coming to us from Pakistan, I think at this point, Cecilia Lam from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Anamole Mungulkar from the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Thank you to all of us, all of them, and all of you who are joining us today to celebrate the launch of the Net Zero on Campus Guide and Online Toolkit. And I hope it promotes lots of collaboration and discussion in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Margaret. And the key point you made there, we can do so much more together than we can do on our own. And this guide and this community of practice is all about collaborating on the journey to net zero. It's now my pleasure to introduce the lead author on the guide, Rebecca Powell. Rebecca manages the infrastructure program in the cities team at Climate Work Centre here at Monash, leading research and policy analysis projects to support government and industry to decarbonise their infrastructure. Rebecca's done a huge amount in putting together this guide and she will introduce the guide structure and help navigate around the vast array of resources that the guide covers. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, John. And I'm just started sharing my screen. So hopefully you can all see that because I'm here today to talk for the next 10 minutes to take you through the comprehensive guide that we've put together to help um, universities reach net zero. So this guide has been developed for um, campus sustainability managers, university administration and facility operators, university board members and directors, as well as student bodies, because we recognize that these groups have direct control over their campus operations, but also because they campus decarbonization requires systematic efforts, including both bottom up and top down approaches. So if you're sitting here today and you have a direct um, influence over your, your campus decarbonization journey, this is for you. And this will help answer some questions such as your university has made a commitment to net zero. So what's the next step? Or what resources are out there to help you understand the benefits and challenges in reducing your campus energy demands? As John said before, I'd like to acknowledge that this um, guide has been developed with global expertise in order to ensure that the initiative accounts for geographical, cultural and institutional needs of global universities. So big thanks goes out to SDSN for mobilizing such a diverse and committed advisory panel have, who have been involved throughout the guide's development. 
Our advisors provided the expert input, both as end users of the guide and also advising on what kind of guidance, information or tools are out there that should be included in this guide. And you'll hear from our many advisors later on in the webinar. And to echo this global nature of the guide, I believe the guide is currently being translated to Spanish. So to break it down, the first of all, um, there's this standalone report which provides the high level principles, strategies and an overview of the journey to net zero on campus. But then accompanying this report is an online toolkit which is comprehensive and it provides um, open source resources and case studies to provide your university with the tools needed to start and both accelerate the net zero journey. And then alongside this online toolkit, SDSN Today are launching a community of practice, which will be a digital platform in which universities can collaborate and learn from one another on an ongoing basis. So to bring us back to the guide, the project team identified 17 initiatives across six different action areas. And the guide has a whole realm of other information in it, but we really wanted to focus on these 17 initiatives today. So the, the six action areas are energy, mobility, facilities, waste and recycling, the value chain and beyond campus operations. So I'm just going to take you quickly through these 17, uh, but you have to read the guide to get a lot more information about them. So in energy, it's all about reducing the energy demand through energy efficiency and sourcing renewable energy either on campus or off campus. For mobility, it talks about sustainable transport to and from campus, as well as supporting the zero emission vehicle transition. For facilities, it talks about creating energy efficiency through building practices and adhering to sustainable building practices for new buildings. For waste and recycling, it talks about circular economy principles. And for the value chain, it talks about sustainable pr procurement practices and amplifying the change throughout supply chains. Now we recognize that beyond campus operations isn't strictly about the campus boundaries and or campus operations, but it really recognizes the unique opportunity that universities have to drive change through their leadership, through networks, engaged student bodies and through research and innovation and acknowledging that universities really are positioned to help drive climate change action across their community. So for each of these 17 initiatives, you'll find them in the guide where they contain an overview of it, the benefits and challenges of implementing that initiative on campus, different details or, that will help implement it, such as checklists, infographics, or how-to guides in implementing that initiative. And then a vast array of additional resources that already exist that will help um, give you the more tools to successfully implement that initiative on campus. And an example of what that looks like in the guide is here. This is a page that's been taken out from reducing campus energy demand. And you can, this is replicated across all 17 initiatives in the guide. So that's an overview of the guide. I also wanted to take you through the online toolkit that exists. So the online toolkit has both resources and global case studies. It's sort of an appendix to the guide that will be continually updated as this progresses. It, in terms of resources, it talks about, it hosts um, web pages, reports, tools, webinars, um, things like that, that would help across all different types of initiatives or net zero um, information. And then it also includes global case studies, which have been collated from universities across SDSN's network in how they have successfully implemented different types of initiatives on campus. So there are so many resources out there and to help you out, we have um, put them in a handy table and they can be filtered, filtered by theme, filtered by initiative, filtered by type or by decarbonisation stage. And by decarbonisation stage, we mean whether your university is just starting net zero or whether it is sort of an advanced university, one that um, is leading in research and innovation in climate change initiatives. So then also case studies are being collated and will continually be updated online. But we welcome you if your university has a really good initiative in which they can share with the world, then submit your own case study um, by contacting SDSN by their email address. 
So this toolkit is hosted on the SDSN website and you can go to this address or I think John has popped it in the chat as well. Um, and if you scroll down this website, you'll see the table of contents, which shows you all that information um, relating to the guide and the toolkit. You can download the guide from here and equally um, you can then access all the other tools as well. So if I take you to the online toolkit, you click on that and you'll get all the different action areas. So the six different action areas as a reminder, energy, mobility, facilities, waste, value chain and beyond campus. Um, and if you click on, for example, energy, you'll then be taken to the energy page, which hosts the resources and case studies, as well as other supporting information. So if you scroll down, you'll see a table that looks like this, which you can then filter, you can expand to then under, um, help direct you to the information that's most important to you to help you um, address, for example, energy demand on campus. And then if you scroll past that table, you'll see the different case studies. Currently, we have four case studies from around the world that are featured on the website. And like I said, you're welcome um, to contribute your own case study so that others can learn from your experiences. And so with that, I want to encourage you to really get involved with this toolkit. Please share your case studies, resources or feedback with SDSN. And then also, as I said earlier, there's the community of practice is um, being launched later today. So you can scan this QR code or you can um, join the community of practice. I think there'll be a link popped in the chat. So give that one a go. Um, you'll get a Google form which you can fill out and then you'll be notified of the next steps in joining that community of practice. So with that, I would like to hand over to Srijan, Srijan Pandey, who's the General Manager of the Monash Energy Institute, and he'll be introducing our panel members. Thank you, Vic. Um, hello, everybody. I, I'm pleased to invite colleagues who are spearheading innovative solutions to share their experiences with today. The format will be a short presentation from each colleague and a Q&A discussion. So we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A function down below. And in the order of presentations, I'm now pleased to introduce uh, Cecilia Lam. Cecilia Lam is the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Cecilia leads the university's strategic planning in social responsibility and sustainable development. Following Cecilia will be Kendra Wasilik. Kendra is the Program Director of the Net Zero Initiative at Monash University. Kendra is responsible for Monash University's Net Zero and Sustainability programs. Then we'll have Amol Mangluka, Senior Consultant at Indian Institute for Human Settlements, specialising in strategic campus planning, green building policies, spatial design and sustainable materials through research and practice. Amol is also developing the Institute's Sustainable Living Lab. And finally, we will have Miriam Kugeli, who's the G Global Senior Manager for Environment and Sustainability at Aga Khan University. Miriam leads the strategic direction, implementation, and continuous improvement of the university's environmental strategy, focusing on operational net zero goals. So Cecilia, Kendra, Amol, and Miriam are also active contributors to the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And as John and uh, Margaret and um, uh, my colleague uh, Bick have already highlighted, they serve on the Global Advisory Panel for the Net Zero on Campus Initiative. And I'd like to thank this. Uh, I'd like to thank them for their contributions at this moment. So I now invite Cecilia to speak about the Chinese University of Hong Kong experience. Uh, over to you, Cecilia. Thank you, Srijan. Good afternoon from Hong Kong. Um, thanks SDSN, Monash University Energy Institute and Climate Works for the opportunity to share the Chinese University of Hong Kong's experience in net zero on campus. The focus of my sharing today is governance and leadership for achieving net zero. We believe that strong governance and leadership as demonstrated by Monash example plays a crucial role in the university's ability to achieve net zero. First, university management must set clear vision and goals. When we kicked off a new strategic planning cycle some two years ago, we took advantage of the planning process and made net zero a priority of our mission. 
In the resultant strategic plan, we made carbon neutrality by 2038 one of our university social responsibility goals. Management also ensured that our planning process involved the identification of potential barriers and possible solutions, and the hiring of consultants to provide objective assessment and advice in the development of our net zero roadmap. Secondly, the university governance and leadership must establish a supportive framework and allocate resources. For example, we set policies to guide action and best practice in different areas in our operations, such as procurement. We provide incentives to encourage the campus community's commitment to results and also performance. Also, to ensure that net zero is a priority in all decision-making processes, we have established a central level office, the Social Responsibility and Sustainable Development Office, to coordinate and support efforts across different areas. Thirdly, the university governance and leadership must drive innovation and collaboration. We set out to build a low carbon campus through innovations and technologies, such as the application of solar energy and green transportation options. We make significant investments in R&D. We welcome and seek collaboration with strategic partners to maximize the positive impact of our research and innovation. Finally, strong university governance and leadership ensures accountability and fosters communication. Achieving net zero requires a robust system to monitor and track progress. At CHK, we have a proper committee structure with clear lines of accountability to oversee and, uh, the um, implementation of policies and also work plans. We also ensure to engage stakeholders and make use of the feedback collected for continuous improvement of our net zero agenda. In conclusion, achieving net zero on campus requires strong governance and leadership in goal setting, framework for action, impactful innovation through collaboration, and finally, accountability. So this is my brief sharing today. I look forward to our discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Cecilia. Uh, governance being critical and uh, just as important as, of course, financing net zero ambitions that we have. So uh, we'll move to invite Kendra to discuss the financing aspects uh, using Monash's case example. Kendra, over to you. Thank you, Shrijan. Um, so yes, I am just going to give you a quick high-level overview of how you go about financing for sustainability. Um, God, who changes the slide? Thank you. Um, so I've done a, a really high level table for you just to see the potential sources of income or of finance that you can draw upon, some examples of what we've done at Monash, and then also some projects we funded with that type of finance. Um, and I'll particularly highlight our climate bond and sustainability linked loan. Um, but the first one is obviously your capital plan and your ongoing operating budget. Um, and what I wanted to highlight here is there's lots of tools and case study examples in the guide that can help you with things around how do you do the business case, how do you figure out your um, return on investment. Um, and my advice is also that having really good design and construction standards is very helpful to getting the best outcome. Um, so raising debt, that is one that Monash has particularly um, focused on. Um, so as Margaret had mentioned at the start, we were the first in 2017 to raise a $218 million climate bond. We subsequently raised another one, so we're sitting at about $400 million um, in climate bond. Um, and what a climate bond is, is essentially it's raising debt. Um, so rather than doing it through the traditional government or bank model, you do it in more corporate style um, debt markets, such as the US private placement market. Um, and to be certified under a climate bond, the asset has to achieve a certain um, carbon emissions profile for the life of the bond. So they vary between 20 to 30 years. Um, and we get audited annually to make sure we are achieving that emissions intensity target for those um, projects. Um, and it's I guess the other thing to point out with a climate bond is that the funds are proceeds based. So you raise the funds and they have to go on the specific assets. So we've done a number of new building projects. We've done um, building refurbishments, um, a, a large program of LED lighting upgrades, internal and external, um, and solar rooftop PV. Um, the other financial um, 
mechanism that we've used is a sustainability linked loan. And it's not so much about capital that we raise to do projects, it's more um, giving us a new accountability measure as a university to make sure that we are being sustainable as an organization. Um, so in refinancing some of its debt last year, the university um, did a sustainability linked loan as part of its overall debt package. And what that means is that the money can be used for general purposes, but there is um, five sustainable performance targets linked to that um, interest rate. And if we don't hit the targets for those um, sustainability targets, then there's a um, an interest rate penalty. Um, if we exceed them, there's an interest rate bonus. And if we fall within a range, then there's no penalty or no bonus. Um, the other things that are always on the, we're always looking out for government grants. So particularly post COVID, there was quite a few around energy efficiency, which helped us do some building energy system upgrades and hot water electrification. The, the other one that we've probably focused on a lot as well is um, partnering with our research community and external community partners and industry partners. And they're kind of crisscross because they're not sort of neat and they do sort of overlap. and. Um, I guess the thing is, is how do we, or we look for opportunities to both leverage research funding to test and learn on campus, but then also how do we um, leverage the capital spend we're doing to get research outcomes? Um, and the Monash microgrid was a good one example of that. And also how we partner with industry to access grants that we might not have directly had access to um, because we couldn't be the lead organization. And the zero emissions bus trial is an, another example of that. Um, low interest, um, zero finance, it's fine. Um, zero interest finance, we haven't gone down that route, but there are many organizations that do that kind of um, finance. The thing is you might find as a university, you have um, you can get cheaper finance yourself. Um, so I thought I'd throw up a picture of that's our bus loop at the Clayton campus. And we, in partnership with the Victorian government, CDC buses, NG, who's an electricity retailer, and ourselves have the first off site charging station for electric buses in the network um, and from us yeah it was us giving the the land and the electricity and the funding being sought by ng and cbc buses and then one last thing to consider in financing sustainability is actually procuring the renewable energy um, which margaret mentioned we're over 55 percent now at monash and we just physically can't fit that much renewable energy on our campus. Um, so we purchased from the Marawar Wind Farm, which is about four hours away. Um, so it's actually a financial contract model called Contract for Difference, where they sell the electricity to the grid. We have a fixed price. And if it sells for more, we get a benefit. If it sells for less, we, we top it up. Um, and then at the end of the year, we sort of settle where we're sitting and we tend to end up being cash flow neutral. And sometimes we have wood years, like last year was quite good because the energy market was a bit crazy. Um, so that's all for me. Thanks. Thank you, Kendra. It's um, the cost of financing is obviously increasing in our region. So the innovation is going to be crucial. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, next, I'll welcome Amol to share learnings from the Indian Institute of Human Settlements. Amol, over to you. Yeah. Hi, Srijan. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so I would be talking about like uh, what we are trying to do here at uh, campus uh, at IHS. So basically, like I would like to say that like uh, we have a great opportunity to use the campus sites as a living lab. And also we called it as a long-term urban ecological observatory because like all the systems what we try to develop, plan and uh, implement are actually a good case examples for the cities and uh, outside the campus, like it can be a very good case uh, to learn from that and like uh, transform the urban uh, development across uh, the country. So that's why like we call it as an urban ecological observatory and like uh, what we feel is like uh, it's not only about the independent systems uh, like water energy and all but like it's all together uh, what we have to look at it uh, when we develop any kind of a campus or university so the first one like what is most critical is like the biodiversity because like uh, we all always know that like uh, while focusing on all other developments like the biodiversity is what is getting harmed at uh, most and thus like uh, we try to see that like uh, Biodiversity is one of the most important indicator of like what other developments are happening at site. So that's like our first priority and being net zero in terms of water is one of the critical parameter like uh, how to uh, use the surface water collection, uh, rainfall runoff collection at site and like utilize for our 
demands at campus and like how to become net zero in terms of water is one of the critical parameters that we are looking at and uh, not only the surface water bodies but there are like open wells which has been traditionally used across india you know, we are trying to revive the technology giving a case example from the campus and also we are intensively uh, monitoring this like uh, how these systems are behaving and like what are the learnings from that and also like in case of urban agriculture and food farms like even the food systems are like one of the uh, very important ecosystem what we can demonstrate at campus be it uh, like a food farm or like a food forest or like a dense forest kind of an activity and like uh, this being in a uh, year international year of millets we also have like a food uh, like agricultural farms like growing millets at campus so uh, basically like also using the manure like collecting the waste from the city and like ma making it into a compost and using it uh, for the urban agriculture so that it forms like a closed loop at campus and even with the energy systems we are trying to look at like how we can make it uh, net zero in terms of energy by utilizing like various parameters like one is like the generation but also like uh, some kind of a, uh, solutions like how to save the energy by operating the systems at a uh, different way like uh, even the equipments which are being handled at campus they are like time to timed in such a way that like we don't have like a shortage of electricity uh, from whatever we are generating so for example in case of environment lab there are like huge equipments which have to run through consuming lot of power we have a timing to use those equipment and it's uh, based on the generation of electricity so this kind of uh, situations can be handled uh, in such a way and same with the iot systems like uh, because all these uh, systems have to be heavily monitored to take decisions like uh, for its maintenance there are like weather stations and like uh, internal uh, thermal comfort sensors or like temperature sensors inside the site uh, like across the site as well as inside the buildings like uh, what we are trying to monitor so that we can take decisions uh, based on that even with the mobility services like uh, and infrastructure it's not only about the what we are looking at like reducing the amount of energy by using the green vehicles and all but it's also about the infrastructure in terms of roads there are like uh, different systems like uh, using stone and mud concrete for the roads so that the embodied energy is like getting reduced uh, while constructing the roads also then same with the buildings like uh, in fact like uh, along with the designing with the passive building strategy there is also a way to use like soil from the site uh, to make the building blocks and use the uh, building materials which are actually made on the site so in that way we reduce the uh, embodied energy of the materials as well as like uh, uh, improve the quality of life uh, within the building so that's the approach what we started with and uh, even the boundary walls and all were taken as like example to make it like a teaching and learning uh, thing at a site so this is a case of a site office where we extensively experimented uh, in terms of lots of building technologies and like systems to put in place like uh, lots of technologies were integrated into this building so that like uh, we know like how they are working at this particular site so uh, this building is like completely insulated from outside and even if it is like earth based material we try to insulate it uh, with the industrial material and again clad with the earth based materials back or like a stone uh, back to that and we are trying to uh, check the thermal performance like how it is uh, acting in terms of uh, creating a, th a thermal comfort considering the 1.5 degree raise in the temperature because like we have to design it for future uh, what we are looking at this experimental and it's like uh, using this earth friendly materials and innovative technologies to test and uh, check the performance of the building and even there are like uh, water and all everything is monitored like in terms of uh, its use and all within the building so that we take uh, uh, decisions based on like what we are getting the data and also one of the important part that universities can play is like uh, they can be like a good place to expose the outside people to whatever we are developing at site and like disseminate the knowledge uh, which is being generated at campus so there were like uh, many programs which ihs runs like urban fellowship program or like urban practitioner program where like government officials can come and learn from the site and students from across the colleges like within the city or like outside the city can come and learn from campus and also like we have a program called as like we are uh, uh, hosting a program called Solar Decathlon India, where like almost like uh, 1600 students have participated to design the net zero building. So even that is one kind of initi initiative where uh, we could involve the next generation learners like to 
learn these technologies and like make it at a larger scale, like to take it at a very larger scale. So this is how like even like it's a uh, practice based training it, not uh, just an exposure visit. Like you could see in one of the images, the uh, learners were actually involved in like making a round earth wall, which is like a earth based wall. And it's part of their curriculum in the urban fellowship program. So it would be like made it as a proper curriculum and like people can learn as well, like while the campus is being built out. So that's the way like uh, uh, the main three key things are like the campus can be as a living lab and we can explore a lot of uh, sustainable technologies at site. And building is like one key component where there are like lots of integration is happening and like uh, research is happening to take care like our future buildings uh, across the cities and globe turn into a sustainable buildings. And third is like how to disseminate the knowledge in a larger way so that like uh, it has a greater impact at a larger level. So yeah, that's it. And if you Thanks. would like to connect uh, later, I think I would be happy to uh, answer more of the questions later. Yeah. Thank Perfect. you very much. Thank you very much, Amal, for showcasing your eco-friendly modern infrastructure um, using sustainable materials. And now finally, Miriam, uh, the floor is yours. The virtual floor is yours. Um, to discuss the challenging topic of addressing scope three emissions. Over to you. Thank you, Shridran. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for this opportunity to be part of this wonderful launch today. So um, as uh, Shridran has mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about scope three. And so I don't have any slides because it's um, it's a bit technical and I thought that's how you know we'll get the message across. So the Aya Khan University was established in 1983, starting in Pakistan, to contribute to, quote, flourishing economies and progressive legal and political systems, end quote. It's also worth noting that we do have a medical college and teach medical sciences, amongst other things. So we also actually run seven tertiary hospitals and 700 healthcare facilities in five resource-poor countries of South Central Asia and East Africa. And so that means that 70% of our emissions, as it often is in healthcare provision, are in scope three. But my messages should be relevant to all universities and stakeholders based on our direct experience with scope three accounting, capacity building and decarbonization. So firstly, scope three accounting can be really daunting. We at the Aachen University had set a net zero target for operations in 2019 and we quickly saw that you need to continually track emissions if you want to make real progress. We couldn't afford expensive consultants and there was no single tool that would have captured emissions that arise in healthcare. So we actually decided to build our own carbon accounting tool. Now for scope three, we are using a combined top down and bottom up approach where global average data on emissions intensity of product categories is further specified with supplier own carbon intensities. And this approach has really allowed us to keep improving our data but also our relationship with suppliers as we collaborate on, on how to use the data, access and use the data. So message two is really to start building your own capacity. And because we at least have tested our tool and are using it across hundreds of facilities, we're now also able to train others. The tool has been made available to more than 300 organizations already. And through endorsement of the World Health Organization, all its member countries now have access to start their own sustainability journeys. We also provide regular online sessions and updates and our tools are simple and free to use. So we've found that capacity building needs on how to do net zero are really extensive amongst our suppliers and partners as well. And even more so in low and middle income countries in which we operate. So while all our 5,000 and more suppliers are now informed about our own goals, more recently, we started organizing workshops as a training and networking opportunity with specific supplier groups and manufacturer groups. Um, so they become part of a peer network um, towards sustainability action. And thirdly and finally, as the saying, perfect is the enemy of good suggests, you really don't need academically perfect scope three data to start taking decarbonization actions. So combined with our knowledge on how much we spend with certain suppliers, and every institution has that knowledge, scope three accounting has now allowed us to identify emissions hotspots and with whom we should be working towards our own scope three targets, which of course in turn relates to encouraging suppliers own operational net zero targets. Additionally, we're finding sustainability to champions, including, for example, students on our own campus to identify areas of overconsumption and where single use products may be replaced. 
one quick example may be, for example, that across all our campuses, we've significantly phased, uh, phased down single use plastic water bottles. And that is significant in the countries in which we operate, where water quality and health impacts are a huge concern. And it has really caused this kind of cultural shift across our campuses and communities. So generally, by reducing demand and substituting certain products, supply chain emissions can actually be significantly reduced. To conclude, our own experience suggests that universities sit at the strategic nexus where research and innovations to improve scope three data can be used to knock on a ripple effect um, to accelerate shared ambition around net zero across both value chains and actually for society as a whole. Thank you. Thanks, Miriam, for sharing your uh, expertise um, and the experience in translation of actually your, uh, the work that you're doing through numerous organisations to manage scope three uh, emissions. Uh, we're now going to go into questions. We had hoped for more time for Q&A. Uh, we might be able to fit in a couple of questions before we invite John back for the wrap-up session. Um, please do use the Q&A function if you have uh, questions, because if we don't get to them today, what we hope to do is aggregate common questions and respond to them via uh, email uh, after the event. Um, there are a few questions coming in before the uh, event and also during the event about students and what students can do to engage in the net zero on campus uh, journey. Um, that's uh, both during their time at the university and also beyond positioning their careers. So what I might do is um, start the, the, the question and we, because we, it's such a good question and we don't have um, uh, too many questions, so I'll kick that off with Miriam. Um, and uh, and also ask each of the panel members to just um, just give their uh, their immediate first thought around student engagement and what that might look like. So uh, Miriam first, and then we'll go to Cecilia, Kendra, and Amal. Miriam, uh, thank you. Well, student engagement is is obviously critical. That uh, I guess we can re-emphasize that once again. Uh, the question is just how. So sometimes when I talk to the students. Um, they've heard how the young generation needs to, you know, pick up the game or, or become active so many times that actually it becomes a burden. And so um, we figured out um, that in some of our engagement, we, we want to find a positive way of engaging them. So positive descriptors or themes of engagement and also very active learning. So sometimes just getting your feet, your hands dirty can be much more empowering than brainstorming or, or figuring out some, some theoretical stuff. Like they both go hand in hand. So, so I think those are my two messages for now. Thank you, Miriam. Um, Cecilia? Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, I think uh, student engagement is very important. So uh, from our experience, uh, we try to do th uh, three things, basically. Uh, one is to uh, empower them with the necessary knowledge to uh, to be part of the, the, the uh, net zero journey. So uh, we offer like um, uh, uh, seminars, talks, uh, 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 visits to uh, relevant you know, organizations so that uh, they can get the uh, chance to um, learn from others' experience. And the second part we think is very important is the uh, change of attitude, you know, to instill a positive attitude among the students and uh, help them realize that they are actually part of it. They have the ownership of, you know, the, the uh, net zero, zero journey of the university. Because uh, if you don't own that idea, basically it would be impossible for you to, to really be engaged. And thirdly is uh, real action. So we uh, uh, launched different programs and activities for uh, to encourage the students' participation, such as the uh, Smart Campus Challenge, where they can um, uh, propose project ideas, and then we will provide resources for them to carry out their ideas, uh, which will uh, eventually, we hope, help the university to um, you know, to be more uh, uh, low carbon and, you know, uh, uh, help us to achieve the net zero target. Thank you. Thank you. Kendra. Uh, yeah, so echoing Miriam and Cecilia, something else I would maybe add <coughs> is um, non-engagement is advocacy from the students, whether that's protest or not. Um, and as an example, that led to student advocacy, led to Monash making its commitment to um, de-invest from fossil fuel. Um, and education more in the sense um, with engagement, we have started, um, someone in our Net Zero team developed a really um, great engagement tool that students will take as part of their um, 
orientation and it's called net zero me um, and then they make a commitment so they go through do their footprint and then make a commitment as to what actions they will take um, to reduce their footprint right thank you kendra and uh, perhaps a good example from what you're seeing at the iih estimate yeah so my key message would be like uh, uh, there is a huge potential to learn from practice based uh, methodology like we could involve like all the learners and students in like actually doing the building the campus work like if it is at the initial stage and even if it is like at a already existing campus like there are like retrofitting activities and all like it's a great opportunity to involve the learners and students into these activities rather than showing the outcome directly to them so in that way they can learn the nitty gritties of like what is the implementation process and like uh, what are the key challenges that they could face like while taking it to or scaling it to the further levels so that would be the key uh, thing like what we could focus on like uh, even like it would be good to like include this as a part of the curriculum like whatever uh, course it may be like uh, not only related to engineering or planning and architecture but even in other courses like sustainability can be like one of the key curriculum part and like they can actually do some practice on uh, their campus site itself like it can be as simple as like growing the food or like building a small wall or like uh, living in a sustainable building or like how the therm thermal comfort can uh, uh, like change like with the di different end uses and all that. So it can be simple exercises in which they can be uh, involved and like uh, we could create more exposure through the campus activities, what I feel. Yeah. Right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, I'll uh, prime uh, to have Rebecca back on um, as well, because we've got a couple of uh, good questions there around scope three. And Miriam, the first one is is for you around um, how many scope three emissions were identified as being significant at the Aga Khan University early on? Uh, how big is your team to collect data, develop strategies, uh, and reducing emissions? So. Um, and the questions from Lee. Um, so if you could uh, respond to that, um, uh, please. Thanks. Um, so uh, we've identified that we have four main categories of products or cost codes in which we assess them um, that make up over 90%, um, so 90% of our scope three emissions. So the suppliers or manufacturers within those four categories would be the main ones that we want to work with um, towards them having net zero targets that then show up um, as benefits in our scope three accounting. Our team centrally is very small. However, we've trained people across different departments. So the procurement department, the transport department, the facilities department, and many, many more to actually do the, their own carbon accounting. And then it's centrally connected and analyzed for across the whole institution. And of course, at different facilities, again, we have several hundred of them. We have people actually collecting and accounting for that data. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, that kind of um, broadening of capacity building has been really important. Um, also, because then teams who otherwise know nothing about scope one, two, three, what all of that means, but they're suddenly able to see in dashboards in our tool where their biggest hotspots are, or they see aberrations and then can actually themselves suggest solutions, maybe better maintenance of an AC, maybe improvements in, in energy efficiency or whatever else it may be. Great, thank you. And uh, Beck, the question is really around offsets rather than scope three. Uh, apologies, but um, there's a there's a comment there. The guide places low emphasis on uh, offsets and why. If you could comment on that, that'd be great. And also, uh, following on from that, it'd be great if you could wrap up with um, uh, one thing that you're optimistic about in this uh, in this journey. And um, and following following your comment, I'll go around uh, the virtual table with each of you um, to think about something optimistic uh, to uh, finish the discussion and hand it back to John. So, Beck, around offsets, please. Thank you, Shreja. And I will keep this quick, but for offsets, we actually found it very challenging in how to address offsets in the guide. And the way we look at offsets is start early and do as much as you can, but that can't replace all the other initiatives that you need to do on campus. It's not a replacement for other things, but it is sort of a complementary action um, and it needs to start now basically. And it can't be waited until everything else is done and sort of just for the hard to abate sectors, it needs to be complementary to all the other actions. And then as something I'm um, 
feeling optimistic about. It is the number of people that have been interacting with the guide and the opportunity for the community of practice to then connect universities around the world and, and share their lessons learned. So I hope everyone um, takes that away and joins the community of practice and makes sort of decarbonisation um, across the world easier together. Thank you, Shrijan. Thank you. Uh, Amal, what are you optimistic about? Hello. Yeah, I, I think it gave, a, gave us a good opportunity uh, to like project like what could be the campus uh, be like in, to take this forward at a larger scale. And like uh, with the guide, we hope that like more and more universities will get involved and like uh, this can actually grow at a very larger scale and we can immediately start seeing the impact from this kind of an in your initiative. It's like very, uh, it will be like a great uh, impact like what we would like to see from this kind of uh, event like because like you are trying to connect with like lots of different universities and like eventually like we are uh, disseminating like uh, the knowledge which is being fr from across the world and like uh, uh, through this opportunity I think it's a, a great thing that we are trying to promote the sustainable technologies at a very larger scale so thank right. you very much for this opportunity thank you, thank you. Kendra brief um, comment around optimism uh, optimism. So I would say over the course of my career in sustainability, I believe the more recent shift that I've seen of um, instead of being the annoying one banging on about sustainability and energy efficiency, I'm now probably from our students and staff getting a lot more questions being held accountable, a lot more getting pictures of things that are running that shouldn't be um, and getting asked questions. So I think that's great that people have a higher liberty in the topic. Thank you. It's great. Cecilia? Yeah. Um, I think I'm um, very excited about this uh, community of practice because uh, it tells me that um, we are not working alone. So we are together uh, towards this same goal. And even though we are on different campuses, in different countries, on different continents, we still have this opportunity to get together and learn from each other. So uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we are going to, you know, make a real difference. Thank you. Right. Miriam? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just building on, on what other colleagues were just saying, I think when most of us probably started our careers or our roles in sustainability, people were like, sustain what? Climate what? Um, and, and now that feels very different, right? Times have really changed. There's many more of us and we're connected. I think that's the most powerful thing to really move move us forward. And also, I mean, in the comments, there was there was a comment around accountability. I do also think we can hold each other accountable. It, it goes both ways. It's um, and that, that will really drive action um, and climate ambition. Okay, great. Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful discussion. I wish we had another um, two, three hours in a formal uh, day type event in person, but uh, such is life. Thank you to our um, members, uh, panel members, advisory members, and to Beck. Um, uh, I will now hand um, the floor back to John for a formal wrap up of the, um, uh, of the launch. Thank you. Uh, back to you, John. Well, thank you very much, Shrijan, and thank you to everyone for those outstanding contributions. I certainly feel more optimistic today than I did a few years ago. And above anything else, it's because we're now in the space of solutions. Uh, we're not debating uh, climate, climate science. We're talking about how we can come up with solutions. And today, from everybody, we've heard a whole range of solutions. The one last message I want to leave with everyone is please join the community of practice. And if you've got solutions in your university, please put them forward and add them to the toolkit, uh, which you can do via uh, info at SDSN. We want to hear from more universities and we want to share the incredible experiences you're having across the world. So thank you to everyone and uh, let's get on with it.